Section 7 of The Coming Race. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mary Rohde. The Coming Race by Edward George Bulwer Lytton. Chapter 12. The language of the vril -ya is peculiarly interesting, because it seems to me to exhibit with great clearness the traces of the three main transitions through which language passes in attaining the perfection of form. One of the most illustrious of recent philologists, Max Muller, in arguing for the analogy between the strata of language and the strata of the earth, lays down this absolute dogma. Quote, no language can, by any possibility, be inflectional without having passed through the agglutinative and isolating stratum. No language can be agglutinative without clinging with its roots to the underlying stratum of isolation. End quote. On the Stratification of Language, page 20. Taking, then, the Chinese language as the best existing type of the original isolating stratum, quote, as the faithful photograph of man in his leading strings trying the muscles of his mind, groping his way, and so delighted with his first successful grasps that he repeats them again and again. End quote. Max Muller, page 3. We have, in the language of the Vrilya, still clinging with its roots to the underlying stratum, the evidences of the original isolation. It abounds in monosyllables, which are the foundations of the language. The transition into the agglutinative form marks an epoch that must have gradually extended through ages the written literature of which has only survived in a few fragments of symbolical mythology and certain pithy sentences which have passed into popular proverbs. With the extant literature of the Vrilya, the inflectional stratum commences. No doubt at that time there must have operated concurrent causes in the fusion of races by some dominant people and the rise of some great literary phenomena by which the form of language became arrested and fixed. As the inflectional stage prevailed over the agglutinative, it is surprising to see how much more boldly the original roots of the language project from the surface that conceals them. In the old fragments and proverbs of the preceding stage, the monosyllables which compose those roots vanish amidst words of enormous length, comprehending whole sentences from which no one part can be disentangled from the other and employed separately. But when the inflectional form of language became so far advanced as to have its scholars and grammarians, they seem to have united in extirpating all such polysynthetical or polysyllabic monsters as devouring invaders of the aboriginal forms. Words beyond three syllables became proscribed as barbarous, and in proportion as the language grew thus simplified, it increased in strength, in dignity, and in sweetness. Though now very compressed in sound, it gains in clearness by that compression. By a single letter, according to its position, they contrive to express all that with civilized nations in our upper world it takes the waste, sometimes of syllables, sometimes of sentences, to express. Let me here cite one or two instances. An, which I will translate man, ana, men. The letter S is with them a letter implying multitude, according to where it is placed. Sana means mankind, ansa, a multitude of men. The prefix of certain letters in their alphabet invariably denotes compound significations. For instance, gl, gl, 
which with them is a single letter, as th is a single letter with the Greeks, at the commencement of a word infers an assemblage or union of things, sometimes kindred, sometimes dissimilar, as un, a house, gluun, a town, i.e. an assemblage of houses. Ata is sorrow, glata, a public calamity. Aur an is the health or well-being of a man, glauran, the well-being of the state, the good of the community. And a word constantly in their mouths is aglauran, which denotes their political creed, namely, that the first principle of a community is the good of all. Aub is invention, sila, a tone in music, glaubsila, as uniting the ideas of invention and of musical intonation, is the classical word for poetry, abbreviated in ordinary conversation to globes. Na, which with them is, like gl, but a single letter, always when an initial, implies something antagonistic to life or joy or comfort, resembling in this the Aryan root nak, expressive of perishing or destruction. Nax is darkness, narl, death, naria, sin or evil. Nas, an uttermost condition of sin and evil, corruption. In writing, they deem it irreverent to express the Supreme Being by any special name. He is symbolized by what may be termed the hieroglyphic of a pyramid, forward slash, backslash. In prayer, they address him by a name which they deem too sacred to confide to a stranger, and I know it not. In conversation, they generally use a periphrastic epithet, such as the all-good. The letter V, symbolical of the inverted pyramid, where it is an initial, nearly always denotes excellence of power, as vril, of which I have said so much, vid, an immortal spirit, vidya, immortality, cum, pronounced like the Welsh cum, denotes something of hollowness. Cum itself is a cave, cum in, a hole, zikum, a valley, cum zi, vacancy or void, bodhakum, ignorance, literally knowledge void, cum posh is their name for the government of the many or the ascendancy of the most ignorant or hollow. Posh is an almost untranslatable idiom, implying, as the reader will see later, contempt. The closest rendering I can give to it is our slang term bosh, and this cum posh may be loosely rendered hollow bosh. But when democracy, or cum posh, degenerates from popular ignorance into that popular passion or ferocity which precedes its disease, as, to cite illustrations from the upper world, during the French reign of terror, or for the fifty years of the Roman Republic preceding the ascendancy of Augustus, their name for that state of things is Glecnas. Ek is strife, Glec the universal strife, Nas, as I before said, is corruption or rot. Thus, glek nas may be construed the universal strife rot. Their compounds are very expressive. Thus, budha being knowledge, and tu, a participle that implies the action of cautiously approaching, tu budha is their word for philosophy. Pa is a contemptuous exclamation analogous to our idiom, stuff and nonsense. Pa bodha, literally stuff and nonsense knowledge, is their term for futile and false philosophy, 
and applied to a species of metaphysical or speculative ratiocination formerly in vogue which consisted in making inquiries that could not be answered and were not worth making such for instance as why does an on have five toes to his feet instead of four or six did the first on created by the all-good have the same number of toes as his descendants in the form by which an on will be recognized by his friends in the future state of being will he retain any toes at all and if so will they be material toes or spiritual toes i take these illustrations of pa Bodha not in irony or jest but because the very inquiries i name formed the subject of controversy by the latest cultivators of that science four thousand years ago in the declension of nouns i was informed that anciently there were eight cases one more than in the sanskrit grammar but the effect of time has been to reduce these cases and multiply instead of these varying terminations explanatory propositions at present in the grammar submitted to my study there were four cases to nouns three having varying terminations and the fourth a differing prefix singular nominative on man dative ano man accusative anan man vocative hil an o man plural nominative ana men dative anoi two men accusative ananda men vocative hil ananda o men in the elder inflectional literature the dual form existed it has long been obsolete the genitive case with them is also obsolete the dative supplies its place they say the house to a man instead of the house of a man when used sometimes in poetry the genitive in the termination is the same as the nominative so is the oblative the preposition that marks it being a prefix or suffix at option and generally decided by ear according to the sound of the noun it will be observed that the prefix hill marks the vocative case it is always retained in addressing another except in the most intimate domestic relations its omission would be considered rude just as in our forms of speech in addressing a king it would have been deemed disrespectful to say king and reverential to say o oh, king in fact as they have no titles of honor the vocative adjuration supplies the place of a title and is given impartially to all the prefix hill enters into the composition of words that imply distant communications as hilya to travel in the conjugation of their verbs which is much too lengthy a subject to enter on here the auxiliary verb ya to go which plays so considerable part in the sanskrit appears and performs a kindred office as if it were a radical in some language from which both had descended but another auxiliary or opposite signification also accompanies it and shares its labors namely z to stay or repose thus ya enters into the future tense and z in the preterite of all verbs requiring auxiliaries yam i shall go yam i may go yani ya i shall go literally i go to go zampu yan i have gone literally i rest from gone ya as a termination implies by analogy progress movement efflorescence z as a terminal denotes fixity 
sometimes in a good sense, sometimes in a bad, according to the word with which it is coupled. Ivazi, eternal goodness. Nanzi, eternal evil. Pu, from, enters as a prefix to words that denote repugnance, or things from which we ought to be averse. Pu pra, disgust. Pu naria, falsehood, the vilest kind of evil. Push or posh, I have already confessed to be untranslatable, literally. It is an expression of contempt, not unmixed with pity. This radical seems to have originated from inherent sympathy between the labial effort and the sentiment that impelled it. Pu being an utterance in which the breath is exploded from the lips with more or less vehemence. On the other hand, Z, when an initial, is with them a sound in which the breath is sucked inward, and thus Zu, pronounced Zu, which in their language is one letter, is the ordinary prefix to words that signify something that attracts, pleases, touches the heart, as Zummer, lover, Zutze, love, Zuzulia, delight. This indrawn sound of Z seems indeed naturally appropriate to fondness. Thus, even in our language, mothers say to their babies, in defiance of grammar, Zoo darling. And I have heard a learned professor at Boston call his wife, he had only been married a month, Zoo little pet. I cannot quit the subject, however, without observing by what slight changes in the dialects favored by different tribes of the same race the original signification and beauty of sounds may become confused and deformed z told me with much indignation that zummer lover which in the way she uttered it seemed slowly taken down to the very depths of her heart was in some not very distant communities of the vrilia vitiated into a half-hissing, half-nasal, wholly disagreeable sound of subber. I thought to myself, it only wanted the introduction of N before U to render it into an English word significant of the last quality an amorous Guy would desire in her zummer. I will but mention another peculiarity in this language, which gives equal force and brevity to its forms of expressions. A ah is with them, as with us, the first letter of the alphabet, and is often used as a prefix word by itself to convey a complex idea of sovereignty or chiefdom, or presiding principle. For instance, Iva is goodness, Diva, goodness and happiness united, Adiva, is unerring and absolute truth. I have already noticed the value of a in aglauran, so in vril, to whose properties they trace their present state of civilization, avril denotes, as I have said, civilization itself. The philologist will have seen from the above how much the language of the Vrilia is akin to the Aryan or Indo-Germanic. But, like all languages, it contains words and forms in which transfers from very opposite sources of speech have been taken. The very title of Tur, which they give to their supreme magistrate, indicates theft from a tongue akin to the Turanian. They say themselves that this is a foreign word borrowed from a title which their historical records show to have been borne by the chief of a nation with whom the ancestors of the Virilia were, in very remote periods, on friendly terms, but which has long become extinct. And they say that when, after the discovery of Vril, they remodeled their political institutions, they expressly adopted a title taken from an extinct race and a dead language for that of their chief magistrate, 
in order to avoid all titles for that office with which they had previous associations should life be spared to me i may collect into systematic form such knowledge as i acquired of this language during my sojourn amongst the virilia but what i have already said will perhaps suffice to show to genuine philological students that a language which preserving so many of the roots in the aboriginal form and clearing from the immediate but transitory polysynthetical stage so many rude encumbrances from popular ignorance into that popular passion or ferocity which precedes its disease as to cite illustrations from the upper world during the french reign of terror or for the fifty years of the roman republic preceding the ascendancy of augustus their name for that state of things is glecnas ek is strife glec the universal strife nas as i before said is corruption or rot thus glecnas may be construed the universal strife rot their compounds are very expressive that which the ana have attained forbids the progressive cultivation of literature especially in the two main divisions of fiction and history i shall have occasion to show later End of chapter 12